Welcome to the One Away Show, presented by BW Missions. I am Brian Wish, and I am your host, and thanks so much for being here. On this show, I sit down with compelling entrepreneurs, authors, and rising leaders to talk through their most transformative relationships, experiences, and epiphanies. Curated with entrepreneurial leaders in mind, we'll dig into these finite moments in people's lives and understand how they helped set their path forward. Jessie Craig is the editor at First Round Capital, where she oversees marketing and leads the First Round Review, a long-form magazine dedicated to profiling leaders in tech and sharing startup insights to transform the way people build companies. Prior to first round, she worked as a copywriter at Evernote, writing everything from blog posts in their newsletter to release notes and tweets. Before that, she worked at the McChrystal Group as a research editing and writing assistant on General Stan McChrystal's New York Times bestseller, Team of Teams, New Rules of Engagement for a Complex World. Great book. She also worked on a broader content marketing initiatives for the consulting firm and ghost wrote for senior leaders with their byline articles appearing in HBR, Inc., Fortune and Entrepreneur, on today's show, Jesse dives into her uh, path and developing as a professional and doing what was uncommon and very hard at a very young age. You are in for a treat. Hi, Jesse. Welcome to the One Away Show. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. So, Jesse, I was reading about your experience and your One Away experience specifically. So, would why don't you tell us a little bit about it and, and what happens? Yeah, so I think for me, it all goes back to when I was finishing up college in Georgetown. I think I was very much in the sort of DC bubble. And, you know, there's kind of a running joke that everyone who goes to Georgetown thinks they're going to be the next Madeleine Albright. And I was definitely in that camp. Um, so I had done a lot of internships. I had interned at our embassy in Hungary and in our consulate in St. Petersburg. I had worked on the Hill. I worked at the Department of Commerce on the Russia desk. And I was kind of trying to like plot towards this bigger move of, of public service and, and focusing specifically on, on foreign relations. Um, but this thought sort of occurred to me that I was kind of getting pretty lopsided and that I had only had public sector experience. I'd never really worked for a company. Um, I had never really had the kind of job that, you know, my dad had had or anything like that. So I just sort of picked my head up a little bit and, and thought that, you know, my senior year, I'm going to get some internships that are working in the pub, in the private sector. And I happened upon, um, some, you know, management consulting, banking, sort of the classic East Coast school options that every new grad, I think, starts considering when you're like, oh, I need a job and I need money. Um, but none of those really felt perfect. Um, it felt like sort of being a big cog, a small cog in a big machine, um, not super inspiring work, but something steady, something reliable, something my parents had heard of and, and would be excited about. Um, so I was definitely, you know, doing all those interviews on campus, had gotten a couple offers, was weighing my options, but I ended up getting something from the McChrystal Group, which was this small boutique um, consulting shop that had just started a couple years ago. No one had really heard of it. You might have heard of General McChrystal, who, who founded it, um, but it was really kind of started to apply his experiences running special operations to the business world, which I thought was like a super interesting proposition. Um, so I met up with a guy who went to Georgetown before me. We had actually not gone together. We weren't overlapping, but he was just an alum who agreed to meet with me. And uh, his name was Will Smith. And he offered to kind of talk me through the McChrystal Group and what they were doing. And he suggested that I join, but not to be a consultant, which I had kind of been envisioning, but to work on this new book project. So the general had already done his memoir, his sort of typical post-war memoir of, of what he learned. And now he was writing a sort of business book on management and leadership and what, what people could learn from his experiences. So I kind of dove into that and I got paid basically to read books and research and think deeply about all these management and leadership concepts. 
And it kind of came to a decision point for me to do that full time or to go back to sort of these other offers that I had. And I had, you know, roommates telling me that it was a big mistake to kind of, you know, take this leap on an unknown uh, horse. Um, But I ultimately went for it and ended up spending a number of years at my crystal group really kind of getting deeper and deeper into writing and content and um, book publicity and all these things I had never even considered. And, you know, now I'm in tech doing content and editorial and narrative and all these things that are just a world away from um, foreign service and, and, you know, the Madeline Albright light I was considering previously. Yeah, that's a fascinating story. And I think shows a lot of courage at a young age where a lot of the world is going one way and to kind of stand out on your own two feet and say, I'm going to be a little different. I think uh, it takes a tremendous amount of you know, overcoming fear to do it. So let's maybe dive in first and unpack the decision uh, not to go the management consulting route, the route that your friends probably were taking and saying, no, I am going to go work at a small little consulting firm that is very well respected. Uh, and, and maybe take us back to that decision. What were you feeling? What, what were the pressures? What did your parents say? Uh, you know, just kind of evoke the emotions maybe at that time or in any relevant stories and to maybe provide guidance to other people who are saying, huh, maybe I should think about something different for myself. Yeah, I think that um, at least the school I went to, there was a ton of pressure to just sort of lock down a job, anything. Um, Pretty much all the people I knew had a job by October of our senior year, which was just pretty crazy because you're so many months away from graduating. And this idea that, you know, you're supposed to have it all figured out and know exactly what you want to do. Um, there's a real pressure there, I think. And so I think that leads some people to just sort of stumble into something and take something for the sake of taking it. Um, and obviously there's like a huge amount of privilege and, and opportunities that intersect to make those choices difficult or, or, or easier for some people. Um, so I was very lucky in that like my parents supported me and, and, you know, probably would have been okay if I didn't have a job lined up, which is not, not the case for everyone. Um, But yeah, I think it's more just that it's easy to sort of just get yourself started on this track and you're running down this path and not really questioning why. I think what I wish I would have done a better job of was sort of picking my head up earlier. Like, I think, for example, like if you went to school on the West Coast and you're immersed in tech and that seems like sort of the natural path, like, can you pick your head up and look and see what other opportunities there are? in other industries or in other places in the country. And sort of similarly where I was, where, you know, it's like banking, consulting, uh, government, you know, being a lawyer, like those are sort of the main tracks that you think of. Um, You know, how can you get involved in tech or, you know, something that's more outside of your comfort zone when you're you're coming from a different world? So that was sort of the main takeaway I had is that I wish I had sort of more intentionally cultivated those diverse experiences. Gotcha. So I think that's a great perspective on kind of getting a wide array of experiences before you do make a decision. I mean, in college, I I did four or five internships and jobs, and it was a little easier, even though it was still really hard to maybe do something different. Yeah. Going going a little deeper, though, and then I'll, I'll come back up for air a bit. When you were kind of making this decision, like deep down, did you feel off base going into the consulting side of things, like deep down, did you like question it internally and said, you know what, this doesn't feel right, even though it seems like, yes, this might be what I'm supposed to be doing? Yeah, I think, you know, no one like dreams of being a management consultant when they're a little kid and you you sort of have these feelings of maybe you're selling out or, you know, you're not, um, you know, Georgetown was a Jesuit school. So sort of being men and women for others was a big theme that, um, you know, it was kind of instilled in you. And so you don't really feel that when you're like, your main client is the post office and you're like recommending layoffs to save taxpayer money. Like it just, it doesn't feel very connected to sort of the skills you want to cultivate and the mission you want to drive towards. So I think I had a lot of hesitation around that, but I also think that I'm just naturally a person who works better in smaller team settings that I think being part of a, you know, a hundred thousand person company was just really not something that appealed to me. Um, and just having more of an opportunity to make an impact. So I think when my crystal group, when I joined, it was like 35 people or it was pretty small. 
Um, and similarly at first round now, we're around 40 people. So that's kind of, I think, the sweet spot for me that I've discovered over time is that just where there's enough people that you know, know everyone and you're really close and you're, you have a huge opportunity to make an impact, but it's also not like three people in a room. Yeah, uh, that's really good insight. And that you know yourself well enough to say, this is what works for me. Let's go dive into Will Smith and that maybe conversation or set of conversations that you had with him that said, you know what, I think the research side of things that pushed you into the McChrystal group would be good. Can you maybe share some tidbits of that conversation, some things you talked about where you walked away and said, you know what, this, this sounds great for me. And I'm going to put my head here for the next couple of years. Yeah. So I think that I kind of had some optionality when I was joining, like I could have been a consulting intern and working on those sorts of projects. I could have joined him. He was actually on the business development team. So like sales, trying to earn new clients, um, or I could have joined this book project. And I think, and you know, in retrospect, it's like, oh, obviously you pick a book project. Like when are you going to get to work on that? But at the time it was a little like, you know, I was the only person doing that, uh, with the other, um, um, sort of ghostwriter who's working on the project. So it was, you know, a differentiator, but like, while that seems like an advantage, the other side of it is that you like feel a little more lonely. Like it was just kind of the two of us in a room working on the book. Um, you know, I wasn't having the same sort of experiences that other people were having. Um, and you feel like you're not on the right. It's just a more amorphous, ambiguous career path. Like what do you do after you work on someone's book? It's not like there's a clear next rung to place your foot on. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, that's obviously a strength and it's like a huge, unique differentiating factor. It's the thing people always bring up when they like looked at my LinkedIn and they're like, wow, that's crazy that you did that. Um, at the time I think I was more insecure. I was like, it does seem crazy. Like, why did I do that? <laughs> so, um, I think that was more like sort of the hesitation around at the beginning. Um, but you know, it was just such a singular opportunity that I felt like I couldn't not do it. And um, ultimately, I learned so much more from doing that than I think I would have had some more sort of standard experience. So I think even if it seems a little unorthodox or you're not really clear what you're going to get out of it or what the next step will be, I think you still have to sort of throw yourself out there sometimes and, and do those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's very interesting. I'm going to come back to that on like the, what you learned specifically. However, when I, similar to you, when I took the job with Alan in a similar capacity, more on the marketing side to start, it was one of those things that I just threw myself into. And I said, this feels right. I know I have no idea what I'm going to do or, or I'm, he's going to kill me in the best yeah. way possible. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, it was the best, it was a very singular experience that would be hard to come by again. So I, I totally resonate. Uh, compared to maybe what you would have, the experience you would have had if you went another route versus what you got in the McChrystal group because of the conversations you had with Will and pushed you to do, what were some of the immediate things or the things that you look back on now that you can point to and say, wow, those are frameworks or uh, experience, or those are frameworks and things I learned that I still apply to my life today? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is just sort of in terms of a work ethic and being scrappy and, and hustling. I think when you're in a less proven environment, you know, it's not McKinsey or, um, you know, one of those sort of proven brand name points. Um, you feel like you have to hustle a lot more and you don't have those big resources. And so you have to be a lot more full stack, like you have to do everything yourself. Um, so that was kind of the biggest lesson I learned, I think, as a marketer was that, you know, I had to run the social, learn how to run social media. I had to learn how to put together an email campaign. I had to learn how to, um, you know, write sales collateral and figure out how to get it printed. And, you know, so you're doing kind of everything soup to nuts. Um, and I think when you're in a bigger environment and your role is more constrained and you only have a small slice of the pie, um, not that it's easy to coast, but you're just not stretched in the same sort of way. And there are skills you would gain around like cross-functional team navigation and, you know, working in big settings and, you know, probably presenting to big groups and all those sorts of things that would be really valuable. But you don't have that same sort of drive and hustle to just kind of figure things out on your own and, and get things out there. Um, it's, it's a much slower moving iceberg, I think. Yeah. And on that note, were you given a, a roadmap to say, hey, Jesse, uh, this is what we're doing here and here's how to do it? Or was it more of a blank slate where, you know, 
yeah, maybe the soup to nuts idea, but was, was did you really have to dive in blind and, and figure it out kind of end to end? Yeah, I, well, so I think like maybe it'd be helpful for me to kind of give just like an overarching um, narrative of what I did. So I, when I started the book project, they had had an abstract, they had had like a couple, couple early drafts of some chapters, but that was basically it. It was sort of like the beginning of the book project. And so the first part, I was really tasked with doing all of the underlying research. So reading a lot of books, summarizing them, writing first drafts of things, uh, fact checking everything. I did all of the end notes, which was just, you know, a, a, a really fun process, uh, being heavily sarcastic there. Um, <laughs> but and then afterwards, it was like, OK, now that we're feeling we've got more of like a substantial book on our hands, like how does it flow together? What's the narrative? And so I think that's where I really kind of worked on those sorts of skill sets um, with the co-authors, with the other, um, the main person who was who was kind of undertaking um, the, the bulk of the writing. I was sort of his assistant. Um, and so I really got to, to learn a lot from there. But then it was sort of launching the book, which is kind of classic marketing, right? You're marketing yourself, you're marketing a book, you're trying to get people to pay attention and care and buy it. And so from everything from publicity and media training, um, you know, John Crystal got to go on all the shows just because of, you know, sort of who he was. So that was really fun to kind of tag along for those things. Like the last week of The Daily Show with John Stewart, he, he was on, which was really cool. Um, so, but, you know, helping with preparing talking points and things like that for that, um, but also social media campaign, you know, like, let's get people interested, let's get talk, people talking about the book team of teams and, um, you know, becoming a bestseller as has been discussed recently, you can sort of do a lot of work to, to make it a better chance that you land at the top of the yeah. list. So I think that was also a really interesting learning curve. But then after the book came out, it was like, okay, you don't want it to you want it to be evergreen, you want it to keep going. And so how can you extend the book and the themes and the content marketing is sort of a natural answer, right? If we continue to author a number of articles that tie into current events or tie into themes that we're seeing and tie back to the book, we can sort of extend its shelf life. Mm. Um, so from there, it really started from the ground up of like content mapping, like what are the big themes we can hit on? What are the other things we can tie to? Um, you know, what should our editorial strategy be? And then going out and doing it, so kind of what I was talking about earlier, just doing both that high level and then the actual like lower level execution stuff. So interviewing all the leaders, ghostwriting posts for them, putting them together, shipping them, promoting them, just sort of the whole life cycle of, of a piece. And I think that's where I really kind of worked on those skills for the first time. And that's kind of what we do at first round too, you know, where the review is a very small team. We're only two people and, and we put out about 50 profiles a year. So it's a lot of sort of managing that high level strategy and also the execution at the same time, which I really enjoy. Wow. So you went from research, carrying out all the little nitpicky things to then the whole marketing and then the strategy and then all the pieces because you took a very entrepreneurial dive in a way after college. Uh, yeah. Very, very cool. And clearly you're where you, what you've done with Evernote and then first round since, which we can dive into in a bit, uh, speaks for that. Uh, while you were at McChrystal Group, I'm curious, what, how did your relationship evolve or improve with, you know, what was that like with Will, who maybe gave you the opportunity? And then two, I've heard a lot of good things about Stanley McChrystal uh, from people in the network. I'd be curious to have your take on how that process, probably working directly with him on certain things, you know, what he did for you as a leader uh, to help you um, in a remarkable way. Yeah, I think what was really great about it is that um, I was sort of the so two things. Will Smith, I think we're still friends. You know, we're still texting the other day. He's just been you know such a great resource to have, and it was always nice because. He, while he was the one who brought me in, I was never really actually on his team. So it was sort of that third party view of how things are going and, you know, getting feedback and having a sounding board. And even after I left the McChrystal group, you know, staying in touch and, and meeting up whenever we're in the same place. So I think that was super valuable to me to have that. Um, and, you know, he's still there, actually. So he has sort of that long lens perspective and has built such a great career there, I think. 
Um, and then the other person I would point to is Kathleen Hatfield, who, who joined as sort of like the head of marketing. And I just had a, a really you know world-class expert to learn from. Um, she had been at Profit and I think Lippincott's and some just like really great marketing branding firms. Um, so she had just super strong foundation. And I got to learn a lot. So that was sort of the best of both worlds when you're like learning and doing a lot, but you're also like in the more junior position at the start of your career. So you can learn a lot from other people too. Mm. Um, so I really enjoyed that. As for General Crystal, I think, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, he is a, you know, a very almost like cult following within the military of people who just really revere him. And I, it's very evident when you interact with him, um, he's, you know, so busy going out um, and, you know, doing speaking engagements and writing, but um, he's incredibly thoughtful. Uh, he would always joke that if he didn't become a general, he would have become a writer. And I think at West Point, actually, they have like a collection of his poetry or writings that he did when he was there in the 70s. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so he definitely sort of has this intensely thoughtful um, characteristic that I think is is incredible. But I think really just leading by example um, is sort of the biggest thing I picked up from him. And um, he, you know, obviously had some, some um, how he sort of left the military was much publicized. And, you know, there was a lot to do about that. But he was, you know, very straightforward and very sort of taking responsibility for that. And the way he talked about it everywhere afterwards was just incredibly classy and just sort of everything you'd want to see in a leader. So I think that was sort of the biggest takeaway was sort of leading from the top and, and sort of responsibility, you know, ending up on you was kind of the biggest thing I got from working with him. Well, very, very cool. Uh, it matches, a, I think, a lot of the just things I've heard and uh, yeah. great to see the consistency. So I want to go to kind of first round review. So this experience, mm -hmm. uh, at the McChrystal Group, you're kind of taking a different path after college, and now you're a first round review. And it sounds like, if I'm inferring correctly, there's a whole editorial side to what you're doing as the editor, but you also have the marketing side. So the whole, you're kind of seeing it in a way from a very high level across editorial and marketing and how they flow together. So can yeah. you maybe talk about this that foundational experience and how that's guiding specific decisions, how that's helping you think about yeah. things that you're doing at first round and and maybe even in your own life uh, beyond work. Yeah, so I think that um, joining a venture capital firm is not something I had ever really considered, especially when I was starting out in my career. But what I think is so special about First Round is that the brand that's been cultivated over the years is really about the firm as a whole. And, you know, it's not one partner that's developed their own personal thought leadership. It's really the collective and it's about giving back to this community of founders and, and company builders. And it's really content forward. I mean, I, I, that was what was so exciting to me about joining is that, you know, content is the star and of, of what we're doing on marketing and building our brand. And that's really exciting. And I think it's pretty rare. Um, and they've also been doing it for a long time. So Camille Reckett started the review seven years ago and, you know, she's been a wonderful resource. Um, and, you know, I still talk to her all the time, um, but she sort of set something out and had a vision. And so being able to sort of continue that and, and grow it for, for where we are now in 2020 is, um, really exciting. And so that's what I've kind of enjoyed a lot about that. So, yeah, I think we are really trying to cultivate a brand of first round being an incredibly helpful early stage investor. Um, so whether you're starting a company, whether you're working at an early stage company, whether you're like thinking about starting a company one day, we hope that, you know, you view first round and specifically the review our content arm as being a really helpful resource and sort of your first call, the first person in your corner or the first place you go when you're kind of looking for information about um, how to do that. So that's sort of the main overarching goal. And content has been sort of over the years the best way we found to achieve that. So with the review, what we do is we interview um, the top leaders in tech. So not necessarily the big CEOs or the people you've you've heard of, it's probably people you've never heard of, you know, the director at this fast growing startup who's in the trenches right now doing things and um, has incredible wisdom to share. And sort of the thesis has been that they, 
are too busy to really stop and write things down and do a blog post or a carefully curated tweet storm, um, but they're really the people you should be hearing from. So by interviewing them and you know, sort of writing up their lessons in a profile, um, more people can get access to their wisdom. And traditionally, you'd only get that if you were being like one-on-one -on -one mentored by that person mm. or you know, they were your investor. And so really trying to democratize access and expand and sort of build a bigger tent. Um, of people who can who can build strong companies. So that's sort of the goal um, from a macro level. And then every day what that looks like is identifying people to interview, you know, crafting those questions and crafting a narrative for the piece, writing it, editing, and then promoting. So kind of what I was talking about earlier, that sort of top level strategy and then bottom down execution has been sort of the biggest thing that has sort of served me well from what I've done in the past. Yeah, that was fascinating. I was in New York, uh, not to take away, but just to come back to it. Yeah. I was in New York two weeks ago with an investor. Uh, I used to work for him, an investment fund called Kairos. And it was interesting. Essentially, he was discussing uh, thought leadership and how investors are selling their thought leadership. Mm -hmm. And they need brands and they need content arms, personal brands. But they, But from your point, I think what's fascinating is First round is one of the only, if if only that I think is is the driving content so well at a very high level to almost maybe, I assume there's deal flow component to the work that happens behind the scenes that because of what you're putting out, it's like there's a recognition and trust with who you invest into. Uh, and, and just to go to the show you like investors do need, um, their own, they, they need to have a brand and you're kind yeah. of creating that umbrella for a strong group of people underneath. And totally. so I think uh, the work you're doing is fascinating and you've had quite a start to the career because of the probably harder decisions that you've made uh, and a testament to kind of your strength and will. Um, I have one more question for you yeah. uh, as off base, uh, but I think a great segue. Um, on your profile, you write, uh, which I really love, uh -huh. uh, you write words matter, the ones we choose, the way we order them, and most of all, how we add we add them up to create stories. So explain that to bring us home. Yeah, I think that, you know, sort of from all these disparate experiences, words and writing have been um, kind of the through line for me. You know, when people ask me what I do at first run, I kind of just joke and say all the words because it's, you know, it's not just as simple as, you know, the review, it's, you know, any tweet, it's, you know, things partners put out, it's how we communicate internally. like. There's so many ways words show up in our businesses and in our lives, and I think being really intentional about the way we choose them and the messages we're trying to convey and how other people will interpret them is, is such a huge part of, of my job and um, I think should be a bigger part of everyone's lives, frankly. Um, you know, a lot of snafus and, and, and sort of um, public fiascos might be averted if people were more careful about how they strung their words together. Um, and so I think that's an important skill that even if you're not in marketing is so critical to work on, you know, writing crisper emails, um, building your own personal brand on Twitter. There's a lot of ways it shows up. And I think it's a skill that we need to explicitly call out and, and work on. Um, it's something I kind of honed unwittingly in college like I don't I wasn't an English major or you know sort of that traditional path you might think for someone who ends up in content um I was like a Russian studies major so working actively on another language but um <laughs> I think I did a lot of sort of you know research and writing papers on political theory and things like that where I was building those skills but I wasn't I kind of hadn't made the connection for myself that that was a passion for me and that was something I was interested in and that's something that would be super important for working in the tech world um, so I think just calling that out more explicitly and and everyone whether you're in marketing or not kind of having a goal to, to get better at that um, is, is something that I would encourage wow well, that's beautifully put. And thank you for sharing your perspective and insights. And I couldn't agree more. So thanks for joining us today and sharing your one away experience. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for having me.